Would you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21? If you have a smartphone or tablet, you get the U version app, Y O U version, U version app. It's a great Bible app. Then you got the Bible with you anytime you go. And that way you can check out uh, the, the verses that, that I'm reading, reread them, read the verses around them. I want to ask you why does God sometimes let you pray forever about something? Well, it seems like nothing is happening or you're not getting anywhere with God. Why does, why does God let us go through that? Uh, I, I'm wondering, maybe I'll just take a little survey here. How many of you have been praying about a specific thing for a year or more? So there are hands up all over this place, and I, I suspect online as well. You can put your hands down. So maybe when that happens, you begin uh, trying to pray differently. Pray in different ways. You, you beg, you ask, you bow on your knees, you demand, you declare. Or uh, maybe you think, oh, I just need to enlist some other people to pray. Maybe it's my prayers are the issue. So you begin asking other people, would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? Or um, maybe you, you start quoting Bible verses to the Lord. And that's a good way to pray, actually, to pray, to pray the Bible. But what, what is it that you think, what comes to your mind when you have a prayer, a specific prayer request you're praying for a long, long time, and it hasn't happened yet? If you're like me, you think, I probably just don't have enough faith. But Jesus said that if you have at least a tiny grain, a tiny seed of faith, that's enough. That's enough to move a mountain. So why does God sometimes let us pray for a long time? We're going to take a look at that today. We're in a series based on uh, the people that are described in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Bible. And it's been called the Hall of Faith heroes. And we're going to look at one of those heroes, but today's hero does not seem like a hero to me at all. Really, his whole life does not seem like he is a hero. But his life does shed some light on why we sometimes struggle in prayer for a long time over something. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21 it was by faith that Jacob, somebody say Jacob. Jacob, Jacob promised, uh, by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Let me read that one more time. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. So what? Did that even require faith? Maybe it required like that seed of faith that it takes to even pray at all, to say a prayer or to say a blessing or to, it says that he worshiped. It, it does take a, a, a grain of faith to believe that God's there and worship him, but so what? This is what lands him in the hall of faith, heroes? When he was old and dying? He blessed his grandkids and worshiped? This is heroic, courageous faith? Who is this Jacob anyway? He is the son of Isaac, grandson of Abraham. And if you've been here for, if you've heard some of the other messages in the series, you heard us talk for a couple weeks about Abraham and Sarah. So he, um, Jacob is their grandson. And God often describes himself using this guy's name. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's the Jacob we're talking about. These are the beginning of the people of God, of, of God's chosen nation, Israel. Now, Jacob was a twin. Do I have any other twins here? Yeah. Any other twins? So at least one. Yeah, yeah, and, and yep, and, and one back there. That's right, that's right. Uh, so you know what it's like to be a twin, and he was a twin. But even in the womb, when Jacob was still in the womb with his twin brother, Esau, they were duking it out in there. 
It wasn't just like a little move or, you know, like, can you scooch over a little bit, please, dear brother? Oh, why, yes, awfully. I'd, I'd be delighted to do that. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, you go first. No, you go first. It's okay. And it wasn't like that at all. They were throwing punches in the womb. So much so that their mother, Rebecca, went to, the Bible says, went to the Lord to ask about it. What is going on in my womb right now? Because it was crazy. They were slugging it out in there. What's going on? And the Lord gave her a prophecy about these boys. He was like, okay, these are not just any old twins. But each of these boys, Jacob and Esau, that are in your womb right now, they are going to become, they're, I'm going to develop them into a great nation. And from the very, uh, uh, those nations are, will always be rivals. But from the very beginning, the boys will be rivals from the very beginning. And God said, way back when they were in the womb, God said, one of those nations that I'm going to develop out of these boys, one nation is going to be stronger, and the younger is going to be in charge. In that culture, that never happened. The, everyone serves the older. But God said, no, the older is going to serve the younger son." So the older, it's twins, right? So when we say older, it's like a few seconds, you know, older. Whoever pops out first, that's the older one. Esau comes out first, but then right after him comes Jacob, the, guy we're, the hero we're talking about today. And you know what he was doing? If you've heard the story before, you know this. He, was grab, he had grabbed on to Esau's heel. So there are babies in the womb and Jacob is going, oh, no, you don't. You don't get out first. Get back in here. Get back in here. Get back in. I'm first. I want to be first. Get me out first. I want the coveted position of firstborn. That happened the moment they were born. Okay, that is crazy. And the thing is, that set the tone for Jacob's whole life. That is what his whole entire life was like. He literally came out the womb grasping his brother's heel. And that's what we say, you know, like when someone's obsessed with something, we say, oh, wow, yeah, he came out of the womb hunting and fishing, or she came out of the womb shopping. You know, like it's like an expression just saying, from day one, they've had this one obsession, this one passion, and that was Jacob's. He was always grabbing for things for himself. And he was always trying to make things happen on his own. His very name is a play on uh, two Hebrew words. They spoke Hebrew. The, it was a play on two Hebrew words that mean he, heal and deceiver. And that became an expression. He grabs the heel means he is a deceiver. He's trying to like get you back and, and take advantage of you, get something for himself. And it, it means someone who, who tries to take another's place by grabbing, by force, or by scheming. This was Jacob's name. Can you imagine being named schemer? Schemer, get in here for dinner. Deceiver, go wash your hands, buddy. Heel grabber, come on, let's go, let's go. Get ready for school, get ready for school. That's his name. So every day, as he's growing up, that character was being reinforced in him. He started it by grabbing the heel, but it was reinforced throughout his life. What he, what he is famous for, his most famous grabbing, probably, there's, there's several, but his, probably his most famous one is when he tricked his older brother Esau, his, you know, his twin brother, so barely older brother Esau, into giving Jacob the birthright of the firstborn. So in that culture... If the, if the family estate was worth $100,000 and there's two kids, then the first kid gets a double portion. So I, I, don't, I don't know my math very good. So I'm thinking that he gets like 66, thank you, 66,000. And the other brother gets 33 and a third thousand. Thank you. I knew it was something like that. I was like 70, 35, carry the one. I could, I could not get there in my mind. But the, old, the firstborn got a double blessing, more than all the other siblings did. Jacob tricked Esau into giving him, the younger son, that birthright, that double blessing. 
Then, when their father, Isaac, was on his deathbed, Isaac says, I go get my... I don't know why I suddenly went godfather on that. Uh, now I got to go off. <laughs> get my older son, Esau, so I can bless him. So, so Jacob works out a scheme along with his mother to go in and trick his father Isaac into giving him the blessing. So he's already got the birthright of inheritance. Now he's got his father's blessing. Esau, the older brother, was peeved. He was so mad and so furious that he said, as soon as my father dies, I'm killing my brother. So Jacob flees from the family. He's got this bunch of and he flees from the family. And he goes and he, and he ends up marrying into another family. Another family. Where his father, his father, Jesus, is Jesus, big a heel grabber. And so they spent the next, and so they spent the next twenty years grabbing each other's heels, grabbing each other's heels, tricking each other out of blessings and out of flocks and herds and tribes. And like it was bad. It was for twenty years this little deceiving match between Jacob and his father-in-law. So we're still wondering, and we're wondering even more now, why is Jacob in the Hall of Faith Heroes? Would you turn in your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 32, verse, starting at verse 24. Genesis 32, 24, and we'll get there in just a minute. So finally, after 20 years of this back and forth and being cheated and cheating each other and everything, Jacob decides to take his multiple wives. It was okay in that culture. <laughs> Not okay now. Uh, he took his multiple wives and his 12 sons and the rest of his family and his flocks and herds and servants and his whole entourage, and he decided to go back home to his family land, the land of Canaan. But he's scared that when he gets back and sees his twin brother Esau, who he ripped off royally, he's scared that Esau is going to kill him. But he feels like it's time to go back, and so he, he goes back. He, he's worried about Esau taking revenge, and in the midst of all that, one of his scouts says, Hey, we just got word. Esau, your brother, is coming this way with 400 men. Oh, this does not look good. So Jacob's, of course, assuming the worst. Oh, no, my brother's got a little army going, and he's coming after me. This is terrible. And it's dark at night, and I'm just like, oh, I'm so stressed. Oh, I'm so stressed. I'm so, so stressed. And a man comes, whom he does not know, comes into the camp. Now, this is strange. And what happens next is stranger. Like, you cannot make this stuff up. It is stranger than fiction. They're like, what do you think? I don't what know. Do you think? What, what, no, what, what do you think? Who, who are you? What's up? What's you want to get some of this? Awesome. You want some of this? What? Come on. Come on. And they start wrestling. <laughs> We're like, rrr, rrr, rrr. We're not wrestling. No. Yeah, you can tell. You can tell. Like, do that thing where you, like, throw me down and then you jump on me. Like, go back to the ropes. Do that thing. Okay, yeah. That was happening. How about some applause for Stephen, ladies and gentlemen? That's what happened. Jacob's there all by himself. A man comes he doesn't know. He starts wrestling. Like, that seems pretty random to me. Uh, but in verse 24, it says, They came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. So I don't know what, what season of year this is, but this is like six or eight hours of wrestling in the dark. Like, they are like... Uh, you're not winning. Oh, no, you're not winning. You're not winning. You're not winning. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. They're, they're wrestling with each other. Verse 25, when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. He did not throw him into a headlock. He did not throw him down the ground, go back on the ropes, and jump on his hips. He's been wrestling for hours. And yet he just goes, doink. And his hip was ruined for life. He walked with a limp for the rest of life. He wrenched that hip out of the socket. 
Then the man said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. In other words, I've shown you, I'm the boss, I'm leaving. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, let's not go too quickly by this because there's a lot of stuff that is under the surface here. The fact that Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. In that culture, he was saying, you are greater. And he did just prove it, BTW, by touching his hip and wrenching it out of the socket. Jacob, know, he realizes, okay, this is not a regular person. This is not a rando that just came into the camp. You are greater than me. And he says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. It, it's the, you know, the greater blesses the lesser. Jacob starts out fighting with God. He doesn't even realize it, but he ends up clinging to God. And it's interesting to me that Jacob felt that he had to ask and demand this blessing. Remember, he already got the blessing. He is already blessed. And in fact, God has actually already appeared to him several times throughout his life. But here he is, he is, he's there, he's been wrestling with this otherworldly person, this being, and he says, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. So verse 27, the man asked, what is your name? Okay, this man who can touch a hip socket with one touch and ruin it for a life, this man who could hold his own with someone wrestling all through the night, this man who came suddenly and was about to leave suddenly, this man already knew his name. Do you get it? He knew his name. It reminds me of when God in the Garden of Eden said, where are you? He knew where they were. He wanted them to say it. And this man wrestling with Jacob says, what's your name? My name's Jacob. Verse 28, your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Israel means God fights or striving with God, fighting with God. Uh, interesting, have you ever heard the word Israel before? Is that familiar to you? Israel. The nation began with this guy, Jacob, now Israel. Then Jacob, always, always grabbing for something, says, please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want him to know my name, the man replied. No, not telling you. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, or however you say it, which means faith, face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. Okay, so who was he wrestling with? God. And we, we, we would think uh, most likely it was Jesus. I heard someone say it, and I think that's right. Jesus came. It was before Bethlehem, before the first Christmas. Jesus came, took on human form, and wrestled with Jacob that night. The, the sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. And the Bible says the, uh, the Israelites stopped eating that part of the, of the animal when they uh, had a barbecue because of the holiness of the fact that God touched Israel's hip. So why does this struggle with God go on so long? Why does it last all night? And if this is the Lord, why didn't the Lord just pin him to the ground and make him tap out? And who really wins this fight? Who really won? Well, I believe that God wanted Jacob to have the time to learn more about who God really is. He's the grandson of Abraham, son of Isaac. So he's heard about God. He's even had some experiences with God where God has revealed himself to him. But God wanted him to have the time to be up close and personal with God and learn who is God. 
It's interesting, isn't it, that the Lord chose to meet Jacob on his terms. He went, God interacted with Jacob the way Jacob interacts with people. God came all the way to Jacob and said, okay, you want to be a wrestler? Let's wrestle a little bit. God came to him. He, he, God came in a way that Jacob would understand and relate to. But the Lord wanted Jacob to realize that the Lord is not just a bully that just squashes him down, makes him tap out. God is not just a stronger version of his father-in-law, the wrestler. God is different than that. And if God had just knocked, knocked down Jacob immediately and just goes, you know, I win, match over, it would have been like Jacob's character to start scheming right that minute to overcome God the next time he saw the angel of the Lord come to him. Oh yeah, you got me this time, but I'm getting you next time. That would, that would be Jacob's normal way. God didn't do that. God wrestled with him for a long time. It's interesting, I've heard it said that God meets you on your own turf to make you humble, but he meets you on his terms to make you holy. I love that. God allowed this fight to go through this long, dark night to help Jacob to grow in his faith. And I see some real lessons here in his life that I hope he learned that I want to learn, and hopefully we will learn. First of all, God is more concerned about your character than your comfort. God's more concerned about your character than your comfort. He's more concerned about what's going on, on the inside of you than all those other external things where you're, you're waiting for an answer to prayer. Lots of people have an encounter with God, but they don't necessarily change. But the way to truly change is to change from the inside out. And the way that happens is when you have an encounter with God, with the living God. So we know, looking back, Jacob was transformed that night. He wasn't made perfect, but he was changed in the presence of God that night. He fights as Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter. He surrenders as Israel, the God striver. At midnight, he is physically whole, but spiritually crippled. By the dawn, he's physically crippled, but he's spiritually transformed because he's been in the presence of God through a long, dark struggle. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. I don't know what you've been praying for for over a year. Almost all of your hands were up in the room, and I suspect online too. But could it be that right now there's something more important than you getting that specific answer to your prayer in the way you're praying for it to be answered. Maybe it's more important that you have a time of wrestling with God, even if it's through a long, dark night, even if you feel so alone, because God wants to reveal himself to you. And wouldn't that be the best answer to your prayer? To know God? Maybe we need God more than that healing, more than that job, more than that money. Maybe we need God and his presence in our lives more than even that. Well, it's in the long, dark night, the long wrestling match with God, the long struggle. That's when you learn that. That's when you get to know God for yourself. Another thing I see is that the Lord's ways and thoughts are higher than yours and mine. The Lord's ways and thoughts are higher than than your thoughts, than my thoughts. It says that many times in the scripture, but I just want you to know this. The Lord's timing is perfect. 
the Lord's timing is perfect. We don't understand it. He is never in as big a hurry as you and I are, but the Lord's timing is perfect. We, we uh, sang it earlier, and I quoted a little bit during the prayer earlier. Ask, keep on asking. Seek, keep on seeking. Knock, keep on knocking. And the door will be open to you. That is a promise. And the thing in that passage that is emphasized is the Holy Spirit. I believe that God wants to answer all kinds of other prayers too. Some in this life, some in, the, some in heaven. But when you ask, seek, and knock for God's presence, for the Holy Spirit, you will be filled. That is his promise, and it will be worth the struggle. God is working something good in your life, even when you're struggling to get an answer, even in the struggle. God is working something good. In Philippians, in the Bible, in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I am certain that God, someone say God, who began the good work in you will continue his work. Someone say continue his work. That's what God's doing until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. God is working in you. Even in the struggle, even if you're struggling with God, God is working in you. He is working in you. And he's begun something good in you. And he is going to finish it. That is his promise. He's going to keep working in you through the struggle until that day you see Jesus face to face. That is awesome. Another lesson I see is that God blesses the undeserving. God blesses the undeserving. All that Jacob did was fight. All that he did was deceive coming up to that point and trick and, and connive and grab. But uh, God blessed him anyway. And that is the very definition of grace. Have you heard that word before, grace? Grace is the unmerited favor, the unearned goodwill of God on your life. That's grace. That's grace. God blesses you and God blesses me, not based on your performance, your record, your effort, you're striving. That is not what he blesses you on the merit of. He blesses you because he is God and he has chosen to. He has chosen to bless you. Jacob learned that night as he was wrestling with God that despite all his mistakes and sins, God chose him and blessed him anyway. Jacob had not lived a squeaky clean life. He had schemed, manipulated, and lied. He had divided his family. He had looked out for number one at every turn. But God blessed him anyway. God chose him and blessed him. And you and I could never afford to buy the favor of God. You don't have that much money. I don't care how rich you are. The richest man or woman on the planet cannot afford to buy God's grace. You could never work hard enough to earn it. Grace is a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9 says, God saved you by his grace. Someone say, by his grace. When you believed, and you cannot take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Another place in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. So back to where we started in Hebrews 11:21. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of, each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Now, do you know what that blessing was? First of all, Jacob did something unheard of. He already had 12 sons. He said to Joseph, Joseph, I know you're my son, but I'm going to adopt both of your sons in your place. I don't know if you've noticed, in other places in the Bible, you never read about the tribe of Joseph. You read about the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons. Jacob said, I am adopting them. So they are going to get a covenant blessing that is of 
uh, that they don't deserve. Just I'm adopting them as my sons. Jacob said, you can have others. If you have other sons, that's great. But I'm taking these two and adopting them as my own. By doing that, that was a huge compliment. And they, they would now inherit Israel's inheritance that he passed on. And they uh, later in the Bible, God uses those nicknames, Ephraim, Joseph's son, as a name to mean Israel. He calls the nation Ephraim, Joseph's son. Like wh- this is such a huge honor. And when he did it, Jacob said, he uh, he the, the way he did it. I won't take time to go in the story, but he he put his right hand on the younger, and he said, the younger is going to be the stronger, and and be the one that is revered. And that, that just reminds me of where we started this, this message. Jacob blessed his grandsons. And this is what he said. The story is in Genesis chapter 48, verses 15 to 16. This was Jacob's blessing. He put his hands like this on Joseph's sons. He put his right hand on the younger and the left hand on the older. And he said, may the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day. So Jacob was not saying the God of my fathers. He's saying the God of my fathers and my God, who's been my shepherd, taking care of me, guiding my life to this very day. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm, that was the angel I wrestled with. May he bless these boys. And may they preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac, and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. It was by faith that Abraham blessed them. It was by faith that he took them in to his family. They already were grandkids, but he took them in as sons. He adopted them by faith. It's pretty amazing. So in Jacob, we see a picture of, Jesus and perhaps that's why he's in the hall of faith because God is the God who adopts people who have done nothing to deserve it God is the God of grace he is the God of grace unearned favor and Jacob is a picture of God's grace Jesus is just the fulfillment of Jacob and God's grace in our lives. Jacob's faith in God helped him get his eyes off himself and onto his family and onto his only lasting legacy, which was a family of people who put their faith in the God who was his shepherd. The God who is in our lives, the God who blesses those who don't deserve. Would you stand to your feet? I wanna pray as we conclude. If you're online, would you make where you are a place of prayer? And and let's pray. Would you just bow your heads for just a moment? Lord, I just want to praise you, the one whose ways are higher than ours. I want to praise you, Lord, personally for the grace that you have shown me and the grace that you have shown our congregation and the grace that you have shown each of us individually. Thank you for the favor of God on our lives. We praise you, Lord God, because there's no one else like you. And Lord, we trust you even when the struggle is long, even when we're praying something for a long, long time. We trust you. And so as an act of faith, what I'd love to do right now is just say, if you have been praying for something for more than a year, or that's an arbitrary timeline, if you've been praying for a specific thing for a long time, would you raise both hands to God? And just be in a posture of receiving and surrender. Raising your hands, it, it, it kind of signifies both things. And there's kind of a surrender way and a receiving way. But just raise your hands to God. And I just want to pray for you. Lord, you see our hands raised in this place. Many of us praying about something for a long, long time. Praying for uh, someone that we care about to give their life to Jesus. Praying for deliverance from a habit praying for newness of life, praying to get rid of shame, praying to sleep, praying for healing. Some of us have been praying for so long and we have been struggling, Lord. 
But as we saw with Jacob, sometimes you allow the struggle to endure because you're doing something higher, better, or more important to your heart in our hearts. So right now, as our hands are raised and, and we're just saying we surrender to you, Lord, Lord, we surrender our hearts to you. We surrender how we think about this thing we're praying about. We, we surrender how we think about you. I surrender how I think about myself and ourselves. We surrender our hearts to you. And even in the struggle, we are going to cling to you. And we are not going to let go. We may have started off struggling with you. We may have started off fighting with you, bargaining with you, demanding from you, claiming it from you. But Lord, right now, we switch gears and we just cling to you. And we say, I'm not letting go until you bless me. I'm holding on to you, to you, Lord. I'm holding on to you, Lord. We're holding on to you and we are not letting go. Even if your timing is different, even if you never answer in exactly the way we wanted, we're still clinging to you. Because at the end of our life, that other thing's not even going to matter, most likely, depending on what it was we were praying about. But our relationship with you will. When we draw our final breath, just like Jacob did, I want to be clinging to you, Lord. And we want to be clinging to you. That when we pass from this life into the next life, we, we do so clinging to you. And we're going to wake up on the other side, face to face with Jesus, rejoicing. And none of the struggle will matter. We cling to you. We cling to you. We cling to you. And we are not letting go. In Jesus' name. You put your hands down. One other thing I want to just pray about. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. All you need is a tiny little seed of faith to, to put your faith in Jesus, to trust him, to rely on him, to save you, to forgive you of your sins and make you new. How do you do that? Turn away from your sins, those things that separate you from God. Turn towards God and just say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you and let him lead. Do you want to do that today? Maybe you have, you've never prayed a prayer like this. And then today, for sure, do it. Maybe some of you need to actually come back to God and say, God, I'm coming back to you. I'm putting my faith in you all over again because I kind of wandered a bit. If that's you today, you're praying to put your faith in Jesus, become a Christian. Would you raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for specifically? Online, you can raise your hands to God and I may not be able to see you, but I'm gonna be able to pray for you and God can see you. Anybody else in the room that would raise your hand to say, I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. Would you just join in, uh, with those who are putting their faith in Jesus and just repeat after me. If you're, if you're doing this today, would you pray this prayer right to God and everybody else, let's just pray with them and support them. Would you repeat after me, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want some encouraging applause for those putting their faith in Jesus. Listen, let me know so I can pray specifically for you. We started filling out Connect cards in the room earlier. Would you just check the box at the bottom of the Connect card that lets me know uh, your decision today to put your faith in Jesus, and we will pray for you specifically. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Garrett. I loved how you said that when the fight started, like Jacob was fighting with God, but at the end he was clinging to them. Oh, that's so true for us today. Amen. Amen. Well, um, if you did fill out that connect card, the Austrians are going to be coming down the aisles now to pick that up. Um, if you have a last minute prayer request you want to throw on there, go ahead and do it right now. It's not too late. Um, and then right after this, we're going to be setting up for together night. So if we could have a few people stay after um, just to help us set up a couple tables, that would be awesome. I encourage you to do that. And then, other than that, I think that's it. All right, I'll see you guys next week. And come to the Youth Car Wash this Saturday at 11 a.m. God bless.